Welcome to Modern Education, the show that dives into all things relevant to learning. Modern Education has a guest each week for an in-depth conversation about some aspects of teaching and learning. Join the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford, as we continue to evolve the important topics for effective learning today. We will unpack the ways community members, students, teachers, parents, and researchers approach learning in all its forms. And now, introducing the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford. Welcome back to Modern Education. I'm your host, Ben Woodford, and I'm here in the studio, excited to be back after a few weeks of reruns to have a fresh episode with an awesome guest, and we're going to have a lot of fun. So I hope you stay tuned in, and if not, you can always catch us on YouTube with the archived episodes. So today... I'll be speaking with Jessica Sideropoulos. She is a piano teacher in the area who also holds a degree in mathematics. She's got a teaching credential and a master's in teaching, and she's also the mother of one adorable five-month-old who she's raising with her husband who also works in the area. Jessica's a songwriter. She loves yoga and dance. And generally, I can tell you just if you were in the studio right now looking at her smile, you'd be thinking, man, this is going to be good. I don't even know what she has to say, but she seems happy, and we are all happy to be here and it is another Friday here on the peninsula, so we hope you'll stick with us for the uh, drive home and uh, stay tuned in. So, Jessica, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Ben. I'm oh. really excited to be here. Oh, abs- oh, oh, wait. I don't have Jessica on the air. There you go. Let's try that again. Jessica, thank you for coming. I'm so excited to be here and actually on the air. Oh, yeah. It works better that way, generally. <laughs> I try to have all of the guests on the air. <laughs> so... Uh, you're a piano teacher, right? I am. Uh, for now, I'm sure you have been many things in the past and will be many things in the future. But um, I'd like to just, before we get into you know your, your process and your approach and what you do as a piano teacher or a teacher in general, I want to just talk a little bit about how you got there and your experiences as a piano student. So I think every good teacher was at one time a student of some form. And it's a, to me, it's an important piece of how we became who we are, was the experiences we had getting there. So what was your experience like as a music learner in the beginning? And how did that evolve as you grew up? Sure. Well, I started taking piano lessons at five um, from a piano teacher named Mrs. Gross. Um, and that was a very funny name to me as a five-year-old. Uh, and it's she still had, a little funny to me It's now. still funny to yeah. me. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Gross. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Mrs. Mrs. Gross. Mrs. Gross, she Mr. Was, Gross, we love you. She was stellar. She's probably actually still out there. She was here in the Bay Area. Shout out Mrs. Gross. <laughs> um, she had this wonderful little... Um, nook and cranny in her home called Narnia that we used to play in after piano lessons. Um, that was too fun. It had comics and games. Um, and that's the thing that I remember from piano lessons uh, when I was very young. Um, it was just this fun, this fun experience. Um, as I got a little bit older, practice became a bit of a chore, um, but I still enjoyed it. I'm a very black and white learner. I really like to be given a task and then follow it to completion. Um, so I really enjoyed that part of piano learning, um, but when I probably turned about 12 or so, I just decided that I wanted to do some more creativity stuff. Um, I started playing around on the piano a little bit more, um, writing my own things instead of just reading the notes in front of me. Um, and part of that was inspired by uh, some church music. So playing for a church, which involved chords, mu- chord music and reading from chords instead of just notes. So that kind of freed me up to start playing around a little bit more and improvising and writing my own things when I was about a teenager. Okay, so you you did, would you say it was like a traditional sort of experience for your introduction to learning? Definitely. Uh, music? Note reading, um, right, the lengths of the notes, quarter notes, whole notes, right, reading what somebody else has written. Okay, and you so you got pretty proficient or maybe advanced at being able to do that, and then you got into a new space where you had a little bit different demands and a little bit different way the music was presented, and that gave you a chance to sort of free up 
what you were doing and take a different approach to your old strategies? Yeah, it opened up a whole new world. It made it so that I could create my own things, which was extremely exciting as a learner. So you feel like it was more meaningful to you to get this chance to start creating instead of reciting? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Reciting is what it felt like, right? The word recital, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it's regurgitating information. It's the the black and white on the page that I was just following. Somebody else has written it. Um, and I can play it just fine, but there's no life to it. Um, mm. And so when I was able to create my own melodies and start to experiment with creativity um, in that space, it really woke me up um, yeah. as a learner. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned something before that I wanted to sort of try to contrast. You talked about being more of a black and white learner. Sure. You really, it sounds like what I'm making sense of that as is black and white is like, I either did it right or I didn't. I either am doing the thing you asked me to or I'm not. Is that yes. what you meant by that? Yeah. And I see that with my students all the time where kids will expect, excuse me, students will expect that they are required to perform to the utmost degree um, all the time, right? And so the the act of putting a piece of music in, in front of someone else um, is almost like a, a, not a threat, but a challenge, right? Like, can you perform to this standard? Mm. Um, and that puts people in boxes and that kind of shuts people down creatively because they don't have to think outside the box at all. They just have to operate within one set of rules. Um, and if they are good rule followers, like I was growing up, then they can excel in that. Um, yeah. But it doesn't really wake up the spirit at all. It doesn't kind of, it doesn't have that colorful sense um, that creativity and composition can have. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how you call it waking up the spirit when this literally sort of woke in you yeah. while you were in church. That's funny. Yes. <laughs> True. It is. It's kind of like a soul wake up call, right? Yeah, absolutely. So if we're talking, there are black and white learners or maybe people who prefer that type of approach. Sure. What could we name the, the contrast to that? Let's, let's give it a name. Hmm, yeah. Creative learners or... Okay. Um, I was thinking rainbow learners. Sure, rainbow it's learners. Like totally I'm in. the opposite of black yes, and white. Yes, let's go. Creative rainbow learners. Sure. How about that? Now, do you think people come out as being just sort of a black and white or a rainbow learner? Or do you think there's like a, a societal sort of acclimation to this approach or feeling of how learning should look? I think that's a good question. I think it's dual. Um, the mm -hmm. answer to that question is probably dual. My experience as a teacher has taught me uh, that there are some students who really prefer to just be drilled in a sense. I had a student yesterday who I gave her the option at the end of the lesson, would you like to compose something, do a little improv with me, or would you rather that I, you know, give you some techniques to practice and run through some skills? And mm -hmm. she preferred the second. She, she requested uh, to be drilled. Um, and so I think some students maybe feel more comfortable in that realm. I don't know that, and, and I know that from my own experience, I'm more comfortable in that realm too. Give me a set of rules to follow and I can really operate really well within that, uh, that set. Um, but then there's this whole other side of the coin, this creative side of the coin where it is um, harder work, right? It's harder work as a student to engage your brain with the, um, with the set of rules. Um, it's harder work to create something new. Um, but it's way more satisfying. And so I think that everyone, to answer your question, I think that humans have a tendency toward black and white or rainbow hmm. learning, um, but that it's also nurtured. I think that um, society does value the black and white learner, um, especially because of the, the factory history that we come from as far as uh, public education, right? It's... It, Public education was a derivative of the um, the stream, the stream yeah, exactly yeah. the streamlining of all of yeah. the in, yeah industrial revolution, right? And yeah, so the assembly line, assembly model, line right? model. I think that was the word, right? Exactly, yeah. and so and so, I think society does favor that because it's easier to pound them out in bulk, yeah. uh, pound out students, or learners, right? In, in bulk, <laughs> which is such a funny thing. Or, right? I'm know, imagining like steel fenders for a car. Sure, in bulk. <laughs> probably where the pounding it out came from, right? They <laughs> smash them in a mold and Definitely. send them on their way. Here's my cube of student. Right. <laughs> um, so, so I think that it's both nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah whether or not a student is a black and white or a rainbow learner. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And it seems like it's one of those things where no matter what you're born with, which there's probably, it's probably true that it's not all nurture when we come out of, uh, when we're born, right? We have something in us, right? We are intrinsically something. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of debates about whether what happens out there is at that point is, you know, you come as a tabula rasa, which is this sort of blank slate versus coming with your own preferences and feelings. And, you know, one thing that's convinced me that we really do have our own feelings is my dog. She's actually in here at the studio with us. You guys don't usually hear her because she's pretty quiet, but, uh, you know, she grew up with her brother and they were from the same litter. And she had a definitely clearly different personality than her brother raised with the same food in the same environment, same basic treatment. And to me, that says something, you know, it seems like there really is something to this. We have our own uniqueness from before we're even born. We are special and unique. And then there is certainly this cultural aspect. You may come out destined to be the next Mozart, but if your parents didn't own a piano and sure. you never got a lesson, that's probably not going to be your destiny, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think as a new mother, I've seen that in my, my son as well, right? Oh, yeah. my, my son is Theodore. He just turned five months today. You. He's so adorable, He's by the way. I told her I, I kind of wanted him to do the interview, but <laughs> I, I wasn't sure that on air that would work out well. The goos and the gaws wouldn't yeah. translate as well. Um, <laughs> You're much well more, better spoken than him. Well, uh, for now. Let's hope he surpasses the teacher in this Probably case. will. Um, he, uh, so he is a definitely a patient learner, right? I'm learning that even as an infant, I'm starting to notice patterns with him as a Mm -hmm. learner, right? If he's, um, trying to grab something with his hand, um, he is the kind of kid who's very deliberate and then will try it again and again and again and doesn't give up. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have friends who have children who are very curious children. So they're onto the next thing and they don't stay with the one thing. So even just as a fresh new mom, I'm learning about learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was I was just reading recently a study in uh, it was a neuroscience paper or something where they were talking about how it's really young babies, like six months, five months, they're able to give them cognitive tests where they excite the baby, giving them different scenarios mm-hmm. or stimuli, mm-hmm. and the baby who is upset and gets highly reactive to that is generally one that turns out more to be an introverted type of personality. Mm. Whereas the one who's very cool and calm with lots of different inputs generally ends up being the more extroverted baby. And it has something to do with their sort of probably underlying intrinsic sort of excitability level or uh, however much input they get is obvious even at that age, which is pretty cool. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Even from infancy. Right. Right. So that probably speaks a little bit to this. uh, Is it nature or nurture? Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly seems to be some nature in there. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're talking about this black and white versus rainbow learners. And if you're just joining us on the air, I'm on the air with Jessica Sideropoulos. She's a music teacher and a mathematician and a teacher and a lot of other wonderful things. And we are talking here about learning and intrinsic motivation. So thank you for joining us. And we're going to keep going with the conversation. So speaking about math learning, now I know you have a lot of history in this. I have a lot of history in this. I happen to love math, so we'll get back to music, but let's talk for a minute. Okay, so do you think that math is taught allowing for both the black and white learner and the the rainbow learner, the coin, the term we just coined? Do you think that is taught favoring one or the other in schools generally? Most definitely. I totally am sensing a leading to this question. (laughs) (laughs) You were probably right there. Yeah, Yeah, I definitely, definitely sense a more black and white approach. Um, And it's been that way with music education, too. Um, But we'll talk about the math. Um, yeah, it's definitely about formulas and following the pattern, and but not explaining why the pattern exists or why are we using this formula. Um, and I grew up that way with my math education where, again, I'm good at following the rules, right? Mm. And so that's why I'm good at the math that was traditionally taught um, through my K through 12 experience. Um, when I got to college, I had the opportunity, I think, to explore a little bit more in the rainbow side of things where we're doing our own thinking. Um, we're, you know, approaching a problem that hasn't been approached before um, and being able to be creative and critically think about it. But for the most part, growing up, my math experience and as a teacher, my experience of uh, 
what the education system has been like for the last probably 60, 70 years. Maybe is, 100. Totally, maybe more. <laughs> um, is all about getting to the right answer, right? right? And it's not about how you got there or um, what kinds of methods you used or even if you understood really what you're doing, as long as you get to the right answer, that's, that's going to get you the gold star. Right. Right. Yeah. I have a memory in college where I had a math problem I had to do and I had no clue how to do. Well, I kind of thought I knew how to do the problem it was a calculus problem. And then I got through and I didn't have the right answer, but I actually knew what the answer was supposed to be because I remember doing it. Right. And I did a page and a half of just nonsense totally. notes and then boxed the right answer. Got 100 percent. Wow. And it's like, it's just sad. Well, it's kind of sad. It's I mean, kinda, it's awesome, I mean, but it, yeah, it's sad. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, at some level, I know the teacher probably, it didn't matter whether or not I got, got there the right way because they just looked at the answer. But there's the other, sure. you know, I'd always like to think that the teacher saw that I tried really sure. hard sure. and it didn't matter if I had the right answer or not, but they saw that I had really put a lot of effort into trying to get the yeah. answer. But well, I guess we'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to go back to uh, <laughs> to school right, and ask right, the professor. Yeah. Do you remember that <laughs> test like 15 years ago? Because I do, right? <laughs> Should have given me partial credit. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so do you think there's a value in this black and white style of learning? Because I mean, I think our society on a lot of levels values that, but we also sort of hold up the heroes as the people who do the more out of the box, unconventional risk taking behaviors, you know, entrepreneurs, especially in this area, sure. you know? So do you think there's a value to this, this rote learning? And what do you think that might be? That's a good question. I think that there is value in what we might call fluency in mm. the education realm. Um, there's a lot of value, I think, in fluency as far as um, number sense and um, and patterns and geometry and things like that. I think there's a lot of value in getting the basics, right? Um, but I think the other is undervalued. Um, does that kind of answer your question? I think so, yeah, yeah. I think so. there's some value in black and white education, but that there should be more, um, more focus, I think on the, on the why. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds kind of what you're describing is this, you know, this number sense and this fluency piece. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me, if I was to come up with an analogy, maybe, uh, the process of learning to read and write. Sure. It's Language. like, yeah, it's like, we need that practice with sentence structure totally. and Grammar, punctuation and all. Yeah that allows us to have the freedom to create, Absolutely. right? We can become a writer, we can become an author, we can become a consumer of information, right? I've, been, I've heard it said that we spend the first five years of our education learning to read and the rest learning by reading. Mm. And I yeah. think, yeah, so there's that valuable piece, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't mm -hmm. read and write, you can't interact with most of the world's knowledge. Right. Now, is that what's happening in your opinion in math classes? Are we getting the procedural fluency and then letting people go off to create? I wish. Oh, I wish that's that not were happening. The same. I wish that were the case. I really do. Um, but I feel like math has been painted into this corner of you're either good at it or you're not. Um, you can either follow the rules or you can't hang. Um, mm -hmm. And so people get lost in students get lost in I can't do this mindset um, instead of thinking. Well, this is kind of like what the Stanford School of Education um, does a lot of research in. Um, I, I got to study some of that in my <laughs> master's program. Mm -hmm. um, feeling like such a nerd sitting here at Stanford. Um, <laughs> nerds are awesome. Nerds are way. awesome. Yeah. I love nerds. I am a nerd. <laughs> um, uh oh, I, I totally ruined her. It's train okay. Of no, this yeah. is, got we were it. talking She's about got the, it. The, research, <laughs> <laughs> the research about fluency um, and kind of getting. Uh, actually, no, I did lose it. I lost it. Yeah, no, that's fine. So we were talking about uh, fluency and then getting the chance to be a creator once right. you've acquired that fluency. And, right. And maybe there's a disconnect why, why that never happens in a math classroom. Yeah. And wanting it to be thus. I really would love for students to be able to think of math as a creative endeavor instead yeah. of just a black and white thing. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I want people to think about music, too. But I don't think 
people think of music that way. They don't think of music and math as places where they can contribute to the world. Mm -hmm. it, I feel like m most people consider themselves receivers of information when it comes to math and music, but not contributors. Right, right. And that's such a, a weird thing because if we are going into the classroom having had our only experience in mathematics mm -hmm. or music mm -hmm. being a receiver mm -hmm. or a consumer or yeah. a consumer or a, yeah, a rule follower or right. a black and white thinker, we go into that classroom and that seems to be all that you're able to offer until you've had a different experience. Yeah. And so um, I think based on our pre-interview discussion, I think that you probably try to give a different experience to your students. I'm hoping maybe you can tell us like, what is it, what is your goal when you sit down with a new student? What are you thinking about before you've met them after your first lesson? Give me, give me the inside scoop. And if you're just joining us here on 90.1 KZSU, we're sitting here with Jessica Sideropoulos talking about intrinsic learning and the learning process in the context of music and a little bit of math is getting thrown in there as yeah. well. So stick with us. Okay. So back to the question here, right? What is your process? What is the thing that you're hoping to help a student with? Uh, what, what do you what do you come away with after the first lesson? Talk me through your process. Sure. Um, so when I meet with a student, um, it's about learning what they want to learn. Mm. How, where do you want to go with music? What is your goal? Um, because that's a motivator, right? So a person's desires are going to drive them to practice or to um, to engage with the material. And so I try to get at, at that in the very first lesson. You know, what are your desires with music? How to, have you engaged with it in the past and how would you like to contribute to it in the future? Mm. So for example, a, a middle school student might ask me like, hey, I wanna learn how to play an Adele song um, that I heard on the radio last last week. Um, can, you, can you help me learn that? That's what I'd like to get towards. Um, and absolutely, let's work towards that. Like, so I think, when the goal of the student is more towards improvisation, composition, when it's playing along with pop songs, when it's um, playing with a band, when it's these kinds of like engaged behaviors, that's what I want to help them thrive in. That's what I want to empower the students to be able to, to do. And in order to get there, it requires more, um, more, getting the fluency like we were talking about getting the fluency of the patterns and the basics down mm -hmm. so that then one can manipulate that it's like th these are the building blocks right scales and chords and the patterns between them playing in a certain key those sorts of things that learning instead of learning how to read what another person has written reading from notes but learning the building blocks instead of what makes playing music playing music mm -hmm gives a student the freedom to engage with it in a creative way. Interesting. Okay. So, so you, you sit down with a student and you try to find out what their interests are. Let's just, I'm sure none of your students are like this at all, but just for a contrasting case, let's say you sit down with a student and you're like, what are you interested in? Oh, video games. Or yeah. they have no interest in music whatsoever. Their parents told them they had to come work with you. Sure. I'm sure none of your students were like that, but assuming there was one and then you just had to make this up, how, what do you do then? Sure. Um, it can be tricky. It can be tricky to deal with a student who doesn't have the drive. So this is, this is something that I think we're trying to get at with this show, right? Mm -hmm. Like what is, what is that driving intrinsic force to learn? Um, and so my challenge as a teacher there is to experiment with different avenues and see if there's one in which they engage. Um, and so, for example, I might teach them, I might try to connect something that they've already had experience with, such as do, re, mi, and say, okay, let's play these white keys from here to here, C to C, and let's sing do, re, mi as we go. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, right? We've just sang do, re, mi. Awesome. You've got a connection with that. Um, now, check it out. Let's figure out what pattern underlies that do, re, mi, and see if we can start on another key a non-C key mm. and establish that same do, re, mi pattern. And they'll yeah. play just white keys and it'll be do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Oh man, that was not right. That mm -hmm. does not sound like the do, re, mi that I know. Yeah. Um, and then talk about the underlying pattern and how we can get there mm. um, on the piano. So that's just an example of going down a certain avenue, connecting something that they've learned already and then trying to engage their interest um, in this 
learning of the patterns and the underlying structure of piano. Wow, very, very cool. Yeah, so you're appealing to their their pre-established knowledge or schema, if you will, sure. right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to build on something that is familiar mm -hmm. and then bringing them to something that extends that just enough mm -hmm. to maybe get them to offer some input. Yes. Try starting on a different key and seeing mm -hmm. if you can get that same pattern and then hopefully they'll notice there's They're a difference. They're exploring. Right. And maybe then them noticing the difference is what brings a little bit more motivation to try to answer the question, wait, mm -hmm. why does it sound slightly different if I move up one key, but still very similar? Exactly. Ah. How, you think that would transfer for mathematics learning? That's a great question. I definitely think it would. Yeah. Um, connecting, connecting previous knowledge and then trying you know, a variation of that and seeing if the pattern still holds and then engaging one's curiosity if the pattern does or does not hold. Um, people are obsessed with patterns. That's how the human brain is wired, is patterns. That's why language and math and music are all this interconnected um, map, this underlying web of pattern, right? right. Um, and people love it. And so I think that when you engage someone with this if you engage someone's curiosity based on a pattern, they're going to be with you and asking questions and then you can, you can take them further. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah. It seems so simple too, right? Just mm -hmm. find something they already know, something they can get a little bit of success with, a sure. little bit of confidence, right? Yeah. I wanted to ask you that actually, before we were talking about just sort of the skill building, is there a certain part of that that is just giving them the confidence to create? Hmm. Or what do you think? Yes. So there's an element of technical skill that's required in order to just do the basic functions of playing mm -hmm. on the piano, right? So your fingers have to be able to strike a key such that the hammer hits the string on the piano or the digital, you know, electric circuit um, right. in an electric piano. Um, so you have to actually have the dexterity to be able to do something, um, to be able to engage with the instrument. Um, and so you need a certain level of practice with playing, right? Technique, technique of playing mm -hmm. in order to engage creatively. You may need to learn how to use the pedal, for example. That might be something that will aid your creativity because then you're able to, yeah, every, every new skill that you learn aids your ability to compose something new um, or to create something new. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, we're thinking, we're, we're sitting here with Jessica Sideropoulos here on 90.1 KZSU, and we're talking about intrinsic learning and the value of that, and hopefully maybe how you can get at that a little bit. But we, you might have to draw some of the lines in between the points we're making here, because if there was an easy answer to this and Jessica happened to know it, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. We'd have a much bigger, fancier studio. So this is good. This is great, though. So now I want to ask just about your philosophy, right? If you have a certain method, I know you're you're working on your own type of curriculum and you're trying to you know put this idea these ideas out into the world. But partly why you're here, probably. And what is your philosophy like? What should a student take away from an experience with music, or what would you hope that they would take away? Sure. My desire for a student is to be able to have them sit down to the piano and just be able to play. That's mm -hmm. my desire for my students is for them to have a lifelong ability to interact with an instrument um, and engage with music, engage with this creative force um, so that it can... I mean, it sounds cliche, but so that it can color their lives, right? So that they can have this, you know, um, creative experience, uh, but also so that they can exercise their brain. Um, music is a great way to exercise your brain and to um, engage with patterns. And it, it can help you learn other things by, you know, studying music and by experimenting with music. Um, so that's my hope for my students. And the way that I kind of get there, I think, is by teaching the basics, right? Going mm -hmm. into, but but not note reading, right? When we think of basics, I think we think of, in music at least, we think of the notes, the lengths, the, you know, staccato, the legato, the ways of playing something that someone has already written. And when I teach the basics, what I mean is chords and scales and playing in a key, um, because that opens up the realm of possibility for 
your own compositions. If you know that playing in the key of G means that you're going to be playing G's, A's, B's, C's, D's, E's, F sharps, and that's it, then that opens you up to be able to play anything in the key of G. And if you know how to form chords out of that scale, then you can play and compose immediately. Right. I have, I've had students within a few lessons who are able to create a song because that's all you need. You just need the knowledge of a scale and some chords, and then you put four of them together and you've got a song, especially Western pop music, which is very mm -hmm. easy to write within. Right, right. Um, very simple, right? Yes. Yeah. So I guess that's my philosophy, is just to open up the world of music by the gateway of patterns. Yeah, yeah, and that's such a great thing. You know, I something I was reading recently, they were talking about how it's very possible that the, the one real powerful thing that the human brain can do that other animals on the, on the earth don't do is being able to sort of project future outcomes in our brains, be able to think about what will happen or what could happen or possible different outcomes, right? Hmm. And so to me, that is an exercise in applying patterns, yes. right? You have experienced different patterns and you use those as a framework mm -hmm. to help you anticipate Launch. the future or create a new future or create a new product or whatever. And so you're describing this, you know, maybe what some people would think is, you know, just one little piece of pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. But to me, it really is an analog to maybe the entire human existence, sure. our power in every single technological innovation we've ever had. And it can be boiled down to this sort of simple dynamic of recognizing what we've seen before and predicting the future based on what we know. Hmm. Which brings me to my next question. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago that per, perhaps music can help us learn new things, mm. right? So this learning music may help you learn something else. How do you see that working? I think that music engages both sides of our brain. Um, it engages the pattern side um, or the, the black and white. I, I think we can tie a little bit to our beginning of our conversation okay, yeah. with black and white and rainbow as well. We can kind of tie those loosely to our left and right hemispheres of our brain um, where I think it's left side is more creative and right side is the black and white linear logical side. And if it's wrong, we Correct just Correct me if I'm it. wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and music connects the two um, mm -hmm. because it's based in patterns. Same thing with language. It engages both hemispheres of the brain, right? And so to wake up your brain, do some music. To wake up your brain, use some language. To wake up your brain, do some math. Mm -hmm. um, it's that act of both creativity and logic put together, I think kind of stamped on top of each other and mm -hmm. um, informing each other that really wakes up our brain in order to learn something new and create something new. So yeah, I think that if you wanted to learn how to fly an airplane, it might be good to play a little bit of, you know, improv beforehand so that your brain is primed and ready to receive and learn some new info. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> cool. Very cool. It reminds me of this idea of keystone habits. Okay. So a keystone habit is say, um, one of them I believe is, you know, like meditation or mindfulness. But the basic idea is if you can get really good at one thing, mm -hmm. it ends up transferring to other areas of your life or mm. the learning processes you go through within mm. that area mm. brings you to another level of being able to learn which you can then bring into other areas of your life maybe not directly that mm -hmm. there's a you know you, there right. is the tendency or the the trap of getting sort of siloed in one area because you feel confident there yeah how does that play into your music uh, teaching is there a level of giving students confidence or keeping them on the edge of their comfort zone that you have sure. to think about as you're teaching maybe higher level even I don't know yeah, I think there's definitely a level of abstraction there where you're talking about um, how we learn or just the, the fact that we're learning is going to uh, inform our future endeavors, right? So I think that especially with composition and challenging a, a student to create something new, that is kind of pushing their comfort zone a little bit, uh, pushing them outside of their comfort zone rather. Um, it's challenging them to apply all of the skills that they've learned and all of the patterns that they're able to follow. Um, and it's, it's, in, it's 
uh, inviting synthesis, which mm-hmm. I think is a critical part of learning and creating something new, regardless of what field you're in, is synthesizing information, right? It's taking all of your information, all of your basis, all your foundational processes, and being able to put it into something um, into something new. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, and that, I think, is... I mean, going back to the mathematics aspect of learning, I think that is really what's missing Hmm. when we look at classroom learning. I think even people who are in STEM fields and supposedly have had a lot of mathematical experience, I'm thinking of maybe engineers, Mm -hmm. they get to a level of, you know, differential calculus, things like that, and then they move on. Right. And I think that's just where we get to the point where we can start creating and we have sort of the tool belt filled with the screwdriver and the hammer and the screws and the nails. And we have all the things we need to really jump out there and start creating. And maybe that is not the experience in school, but I think that is hopefully maybe the careers that we go into. We get the chance to take what we've learned and start you know, making the next microprocessor or bridge or... But shouldn't that process happen before post-college or before post-high school even? That's what I would love to see is yeah. children creating because, oh my gosh, their brains are the coolest. Yeah. And they have such inventive personalities and, right. you know, innovative ideas. And so to unleash that beast would be dreamy. I agree. I agree. And I think especially, you know, young people have such an out, they don't know what's not possible. Right. You know, I've, I've, I've heard it said, if you really want to know what's not possible, ask an expert. Right. <laughs> but if you want to know what's possible, <laughs> ask someone who doesn't know anything. Totally. And, or, you know, if you want to know a new way of trying, ask someone who isn't an expert because mm-hmm. they're going to give you a fresh look. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think what you're describing is, you know, teenagers or even younger or a little bit older, they're in a place where they're not afraid until we make them afraid right. to try crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And we should be giving them that opportunity. And I think you're, you're really touching on something that is one of my central hopes for education is that we get to that point. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think it would look like to, to be able to offer that in schools? Would it be people sitting in a desk doing the normal things they do or would it have to change radically to be able to have that? I think honestly, radically, really? um, I'm considering, um, <laughs> this, this is not meant as a p- political statement or anything against, um, our education system, but, um, I'm considering homeschooling my own son okay. because I want to give him that kind of out of the box educational experience that I know is possible. Yeah. Um, that's difficult to do in a, in a mass education setting that's difficult yeah. to do in a classroom. Um, I think it'd be really difficult to apply, um, to change what we're doing now to what would be awesome and ideal. Um, I can imagine just um, students following their curiosity, right? Um, I've had some experience in some project-based learning um, modules Mm -hmm. and classrooms where, you know, students will ask a question and then, and then follow that, um, follow that question with the teacher as a guide, as a, um, instead of the teacher giving information and lecturing and the students taking it, right? The students being kind of the more um, active leader of the project. Um, And I've seen that be successful and not so successful. Um, So I think it's, I I don't know, do you have any ideas about what that could look like? I mean, I have plenty of, you know, desires of what I want it to look like. And I think there needs to be, there. I think there would really have to be some fundamental changes in our social expectations Mm. because I actually, I worked at a project-based learning high school Mm -hmm. and I, most of my teaching education and career were sort of dedicated towards trying to create that. And I've personally experienced that it's tough because there are expectations of what learning should look like. Yeah. You know, that it's, um, we all went to school, so we all feel that we are experts in what should happen in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, there's a difficulty when you try to change, flip the script. People go, mm, I want the old script. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. I know I know what to expect there. Yeah. And I know I can be successful here. And this new space can be a little scary for people. Yeah. And that's understandable. Definitely. But the, the, exp- the, the example that comes to mind for me was uh, if we needed to stop having plastic bags at grocery stores, right? We just stop. 
And as soon as we stop, everybody adapts. And within a couple yep. of weeks, you bring in your takeaway bags or you're buying bags. And you're not complaining anymore. Sure. And I think at some level, we'll have to just rip the Band-Aid off and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. But. We'll see. Yeah. I hope someday. Yeah. I want to go tour a school with you and see what that looks like when it's happening. For sure. Um, Now, when you are doing music yourself, Hmm. what's your goal? Do you you sit down with a goal? Do you sit down to create? Do you sit down to have fun? Maybe all of the above. Tell me about like your own experience now being more at the expert level. What Hmm. is this like for you? What makes you do it? Oh, it's so fun. It's so fun for me. Um, Songwriting is my jam. It's what makes me come alive. Um, And that is an act of creativity. It's Mm -hmm. me sitting down and, you know, oftentimes it'll be based on someone's story. Um, And so, you know, a couple will say, you know, hey, um, part of our love story was when this, you know, my partner said, this is the first date that never ends. And that the first date that never ends inspires a hook in my mind and it gets attached to a melody. And then I get to start forming the chord structure as the basis for that, because I have all that knowledge of those patterns. Um, I can just implement it and I can just start to move. Um, so it's fun. It's creative. It's, uh, and I don't know that it would be that way for everyone. I don't know if maybe I'm unique in the sense that I just come completely alive when I'm doing songwriting. Um, but I imagine that it could also be a really life-giving opportunity for a lot of others, not just myself. Yeah, yeah, that sounds so cool. But at the same time, I think that as not you are special and unique, first of all, but also you have the, the building blocks, right? Right. So I... I I, uh, I don't consider myself a musician, but I dabble. And I just, you know, I don't necessarily have the building blocks or the training. I can't read music, but I just play. Yeah. And I don't think it's the same for me. To me, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, that didn't sound like it's supposed to. Oh, wait, no, I messed what that up. What don't I know? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I'm... Uh, you know, painfully aware of what I'm not able to do, sure. especially listening to all these great musicians and going, wow, I could do that. Oh, no, I can't. Not yet. But sure, you know, not sure. yet. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there is certainly, and, and maybe this speaks to what we were speaking about earlier about how those building blocks are actually important, right? Yeah. Some of that, some of that process seems to become what you fall back on when you're creating. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think especially chords and scales. And honestly, the patterns for that, those can be learned within a couple of lessons. Yeah. It's really not super duper complicated. Um, and then once you have that, you really, it opens up so much freedom. And it's so exciting to just have this whole world open up to you um, to be able to play. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I play harmonica, which Fun. makes it so you don't have to almost remember any of that sure. stuff. It's like, oh, we're in B and all of, all the intervals and everything are laid out for oh, you. Yeah. So that makes it a little easier. It but. really does. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's like cheating kind of. Yeah. We're like, oh, can you play in B flat? I'm like, sure. <laughs> Without the next Grab harmonica. The other harmonica. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what any of the notes are. I don't even care. And it all sounds pretty. <laughs> yeah. I love so, it. Well, I don't know about that. It's me playing still. Sure, remember that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so you, you've talked about composition a little bit and improvisation. What is the difference? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think improvisation is when you are creating something new. Mm-hmm. Um, it hasn't been done before. It's not something that you're reading. Um, it's just coming from your knowledge of the building blocks, just assembling them in a certain way. Um, but it's not necessarily repeti- repetitive or repeated. Mm-hmm. Um, you can just be playing for fun. That's improvisation. Um, composition tends to be when improvisation is repeated. So mm. you start to really like the thing that you're improvising and you repeat it a few times, oh, maybe that's something that I want to play again in the future. Or maybe that's something that I want to write down or record so that someone else can listen and enjoy it or someone else can play it themselves. And that's when I think improvisation turns into composition. Oh, wow. I love what you just did there because you broke down the process into almost like the constituent parts, right? So... You said, okay, we're playing with with improvisation 
and we come across something that's interesting or seems useful or meaningful to us. Mm. And then we take that and formalize it and mm-hmm. give it a little bit more gusto and sort of refine it mm-hmm. and then write it down. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, to me, this sounds like what every great mathematician yep. did to derive all these formulas that we're trying to kind of show. They were playing. Right. Right, exactly. They were improvising. Yeah, they were improvising, doing exactly what you described, getting to a place where they go, wow, this might be a meaningful, useful formula. I should write this in my book, right? Mm -hmm. Which is sort of like Mozart probably was uh, playing on the piano. He was just playing for fun. Right, and then said, wait, people like this. Mm -hmm. I like this. I'm going to write it down. Mm -hmm. And now it's survived hundreds of years, and same with a lot of these math formulas we work on. They've been here for hundreds of years, and it's a... um, it's such a simple thing you describe, but it seems like it almost fits everything that we create, right? Yeah, absolutely. Play with it, see what happens. Iterate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. I didn't think we were going to get this deep. <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting with Jessica. We're going deep. We're uh-oh, deep diving. Uh-oh, okay. Um, <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you just, um, like, why did you go into math teaching? Because hmm. I know you were a math teacher and you're not currently teaching math. What made you want to do that in the first place? That's a great question. Um, I've always been a teacher mm-hmm. um, and I've always known that uh, teaching was kind of in my blood. It's in my bones. Um, even as a teenager, I was teaching piano lessons, actually. Wow. Um, I was teaching my little brother first. He was my first student, Zachary. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I taught some neighbor kids and that was just a blast for me. Um, yeah. So teaching has always been, and tutoring has always been part of my my gig. I'm good at math, and I have always been good at math, and so I've been tutoring since I was 16. I, you right. know, and so that's always been part of my life. Um, math, I fell in love with, mm-hmm. and you know, as I started to explore math teaching, um, it became apparent that that was a realm in which I could explore. Um, the black and white and the rainbow. Um, I think especially in curriculum development, um, I could really fill in some gaps for people where I'm, I'm good at kind of taking someone from where they are right now and identifying where their gaps are mm-hmm. and then, uh, and then identifying their goal and where they want to be and then helping them form the little pathway to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you said you fell in love with it. Yeah. Is there a like a moment or a, a situation you can point to that maybe epitomizes oh, yeah. that, where yeah. that came from? I didn't even know it at the time. I didn't know that it was math that I was falling in love with. Mm-hmm. But when I was growing up, my mom had us, shout out mom, um, my mom had us playing with um, tangrams, huh. and, which are pattern-based tiles. Okay. Um, they're kind of iterative uh tessellation based whatever tiles which are great they're called tangrams and then also these um they were fraction fraction representative uh cubes Hmm. um and i forget their name but it was uh different lengths of wood that then you could kind of uh fit within each other so there were five greens that would fit into a red and Hmm. three blues would fit into a red and so how many blues and greens would you combine toward you know things like that and so Um, there were these rods that we played with to do math. And so it was this tangible physical thing that I got to play with and that I got to look at and I got to build with. And that was math. And I think that's, that's when I first really fell in love with what math could be. Wow. Wow. I'm so glad I asked you that question because I'm feeling inspired by your answer. This is amazing. It's like such a simple thing, right? You think, okay, I'm going to buy my kid a new toy this week, right? And you come home with a baby doll and your kid becomes a nurse. Sure. And you come home with some little... Uh, Cuisinaire ma- rods is what right. they were called. Okay. Cuisinaire okay. rods. So you come home with these Cuisinaire rods and then your daughter becomes a mathematician. Sure, maybe. And it's, you know, it's it's amazing <laughs> how much these... That's a lot of pressure as a mom. I'm uh, like, oh God, <laughs> what am I going to introduce to my son? <laughs> a little bit of everything, hopefully. Yes, I and think so. being a, paying attention, of course, to what they, uh, how stimulated they get, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so actually, uh, since we are getting close to running out of time... And and you just prompted me for my last question or next to last question anyway. How do you think your thinking has changed about learning since becoming a mother? Hmm. I think this is kind of what I was talking about before, but really noticing that Theodore, my son, has his own way of learning already, his own intrinsic um, 
motivators, whether it's learning how to sit up so that he can reach for this toy or, um, right, it's based on his desires. Mm. So I think well, becoming a mother has required a lot of patience at times for myself as well. Um, and so I think that that informs my, my teaching where it's, it requires a lot of patience to, to teach someone in a very open and exposed and tolerant and uh, many inputted way, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Because it's not, it's not formulaic. It's not one size fits all. It's let's explore together. And that takes a lot more work. Um, so I think, I think already, and I'm only five months in, but I think already I'm learning about how to teach um, in that sense. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love how you, you brought up how much your own patience needs to be in part of that process, mm-hmm. right? It's not always about getting the right toy or having the right experience. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's about really checking your own attitude. Yeah. And I love how you, you made that so clear in the way you talked about it. And we are just about out of time here. Um, so I wanted to ask before we go, is there any last minute thoughts you want to leave the audience with, you know, a, a proper shout out to mom or to your kid or husband or it, you already said hi to, I think a lot of them anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> no. any last minute thoughts you want to leave people with about music or their learning process or. I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you, Ben. It's been really great. Um, I think I would just encourage people to let go of their expectations with learning um, and let it be, let it be an exciting thing again, you know, that it's not because someone is telling you to do it, but rather because you have a desire somehow to, to move towards this new thing. Mm, Very beautiful. Value your learning for the sake of learning and enjoy the process, whether or not you chose it or not. Sure. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I am the host of Modern Education, Ben Woodford. My guest today has been Jessica Sideropoulos here talking with me about music and math and learning and intrinsic motivation and all the little bits and pieces in between, which was so much fun. So thank you for coming today. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Those of you in the audience, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll come back each week. I am Ben Woodford, and this is Modern Education. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode. To revisit the content from today's show or hear previous episodes, you can find us on YouTube and Facebook by searching for Modern Education. Make sure to come back next week as we continue the conversation and visit new topics connected to learning in all its modern form. The show is written, produced, and hosted by Benjamin S. Woodford. I'm the announcer, Darlene Franklin, and this has been a production of 90.1 KZCU Stanford. See you next week for more Modern Education.